I'll tell you what you can do. Just go ahead and sit down tonight. And I want you to take your Bible and turn right back to the place where we were this morning. All the way over to the back of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And if you were here this morning, you know that I began a message and only got through one point. I believe that that's what the Lord wanted me to do, was just preach that one point. Amen. And I began a message this morning entitled, Last Things in the Last Book. And what we did was we stood and we read together, Revelation chapter 22, verses 17 through 21. Those are the last five verses that you find in the Bible. And what I said was that when Jesus Christ, the Lord God, wanted to close his book, he said, these are the final statements that I want to make at the end of the book of Revelation and at the entire Bible. These are the final statements I want to make. I said, those would have to be important because this is the summation. This is how he wants you to end the book. It's the last thing he wants you to reflect on and think about when you get to the end of your Bible after you read through it from Genesis to the book of Revelation. And I know you folks are doing that. You're reading your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. So I told you this morning, he ends it with a final invitation. That's what I preached on this morning. The Bible says in verse number 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that hears say, come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And I preached that entire point about salvation, that that was the last invitation. That's the last time. You are asked to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible. But I also told you that not only was there a final invitation, there's a final warning, there's a final prayer, there's a final prophecy, and a final reminder or benediction. And so we'll look at those four points tonight. And everybody relax. It won't be any longer, not much longer than usual. Because you said, man, you spent all your time on one point. Well, I believe that's what the Lord would have me to do. But tonight, tonight, again, as we get into this and we get ready to pray and get into this, I do want you to think about this tonight. The Lord thought this was so important that he said, this is how I'm going to end my book. There are some final things I want to say to you. And I want you to see tonight, this is where we'll begin the last warning. See, we went over this morning the final invitation. Tonight we're going to look at the final warning. And the Bible, as you know, is full of warnings. But I think we should pay attention that when, when the Lord God wants to close this book and give you one more warning, what is that warning about? Verse number 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Brother Brad Hickson, would you please pray for me and the message tonight, and then we'll get going. Good morning, guys. Yes. 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 Amen. Thank you. All right. The last warning in the Bible is a warning given not to mess with God's word. Do you understand that? The last warning that Christ gives you, that God gives you in his book, is not to fool with the word of God. Now listen. Everybody listen very carefully. That Bible makes it very clear that we are not to add to God's word. The Bible makes it very uh, clear that we are not to subtract from God's word. Now, the main connotation of this warning refers to the book of Revelation, and I understand that, and you understand that, 
but it can absolutely be applied to all of God's Word. As a matter of fact, when you look in your Bible, right there at the beginning, there's a warning about fooling with God's Word. There's one right there in the middle of the Bible, and then you have one here at the end of the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. All right, and then you go about to the middle of the Bible, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 6. The Bible says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So it's very clear. God says, You don't take away from my word, you don't add to my word. And if you do, you get the plagues. Did you read that? Have you read about the plagues in this book? <laughs> There's some rough ones. And he says, you're going to get the plagues if you fool with the Bible. And uh, he says, your part's going to be taken. Now, for us as a Christian, these people nowadays that's fooling with the Bible, they don't get their name removed from the book of life. Now, I believe they'll lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ and some things like that. And I may preach on some of that Wednesday night. But they don't get their name removed out of, the book, out of the book of life because they correct the Bible. If that's the case, there's thousands and thousands of Baptist professors burning in hell today and going to burn in hell. So I don't believe that. But I do want you to notice the word in what it says there. It says, um, it says uh, uh, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. Now, I didn't say he'd take his name out. It said he'd take his part out. Now, there may be something to... Um, his salvation being in jeopardy if he's in the tribulation period that's a whole different dispensation but that part there may be and I don't know why, why, how would that go with the book of life taking your part out not your name and is it a difference I don't have the answer to all that question all those questions I know that a, I know that a Bible that a, um, a Christian in this dispensation in this day and time that several of them fool with the Bible and they're not going to hell if they've trusted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior but this is what I do know about the passage. I may not can explain every bit of it, how it applies to the tribulation, how it applies to us in the church age, but I know this. God said don't fool with this book. God said don't take away from it, and God said don't add to it. And he's very serious about it. Do you realize that there are 60,000 less words in the NIV than there are in the King James Bible? Now listen, we're not going to go into it tonight because I've had men come in and teach it. I've taught some of that stuff. Brother Bobby taught some of that stuff. And we're going to have some more men come in at different times in the future to teach on it, to keep reminding you. And, and we've, I've mentioned to you, and you've heard about manuscript evidence in the various Greek texts and the received texts and Alexandria versus Antiochian texts and, and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to go into in that tonight. That's not what the Bible study is about. I'm preaching to you tonight. But I know this, God promised to preserve his word. He said it is forever settled in heaven. So if he promised to preserve his word and it ain't the King James Bible, I want you to tell me where it is. And you say, well, it's, he said he preserved it up in heaven. We don't have it. Well, what in the world good is it to preserve up in heaven? And, and, and these people and these professors, and I had some of them in Bible college, would say, well, you know, the overall teaching isn't compromised and the main concepts and doctrinal uh, uh, you know, doctrinal true, true, uh, true teachings of the doctrine and all that. That's not compromise and all that kind of stuff. Let me, tell you, let me ask you something. If it's 90% truth or 95% truth and, and you say it's true in, in concepts and, and, and that kind of stuff, and there is error in it, and they all say, they all say, all, this is what they all say, we, we just have accurate translations. We just have reliable translations. We have some that's better than the other. But, but, but the, you know, we, don't, we do not have a perfect book. Then how do you know the concepts and the doctrines and the overall teachings, as you call it? How do you know what's right and wrong if we don't have a perfect book? You know what that does? That puts Dr. Smell Fungus in judgment of what belongs in there and what doesn't. What's a good Greek translation? What is it? What's a good manuscript? What is it? Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, or is it the received text? He makes the decision. And that's not right. And God warned you about fooling with that Bible. He takes it serious. It's the last warning he gives you. Don't fool with it. You'll get the plagues in this book. Now here in this church, we take a stand on the King James Bible, and we do not apologize for it. We do not try to start an argument with it, but we will finish one with it. We're not stepping back on it. 
I've never said that a fellow wasn't saved if he didn't believe the Bible. I never said he didn't love Christ if he didn't believe this book. I never said that, he, that God wouldn't use him if he didn't believe this book. That's a bunch of nonsense. You know I don't believe that, and I've never said that. But I'll tell you this, a man that doesn't have the King James Bible in his hand and read out of it and preach it, and a man that doesn't not only have it, but he doesn't believe that this is the perfect word of God, he will never be able to be all that God wants him to be. Because he doesn't have God's perfect book. Amen. And God gives a warning about fooling with it. And you and I ought to take that. Listen, let me just say this. Next time some of your buddies, some of your family members, and all they, you know, they, you go to that church. Y'all believe that. Y'all think y'all right and everybody else is wrong. When it comes to that King James Bible, yeah, you got me. You got me. We think we're right and you're wrong. Yes. Yes. And they give you a hard time about it? Listen, man, the reason we are, are stickler about it is because we know what the Bible says. It says you don't fool with it. He it says it's settled. And here's, here's why, we, why we, we stand on it and they give us a hard time about it. To them, there's no final authority. The final authority is the man in the pulpit. What version he chooses to use, what manuscript he deems the best, what translation he wants to, and all that kind of stuff. We say, no, it's a King James Bible. God, that is God's word that he gave us. It is the word of God for everybody in the world. And if he's going to speak to you and through a perfect word, he'll do it through a King James Bible. And we're not saying that we're better than you, but we're saying we've got the book and you don't. And we're not being divisive about it. We're not trying to argue about it. We're not trying to act like we're better than them. But we got the truth. Now listen, if we don't have the truth, you've got the wrong man up here preaching. I'm guilty of a lot of things. I'll grant you that, but I'm not guilty of being a con. If I did not believe this was the perfect word of God, if I did not believe what I preached to you this morning with everything within me, if I didn't believe I was telling you the truth about heaven and hell this morning, I'd pack up my wife and we'd leave. I sure wouldn't take your money and, and, and expect you to come in here and listen to me. Do you know what I believe? I am willing to die and stand before God one day and say, God, I believe that in a King James Bible, a 1611 Bible, that that is your perfect word of God. And what I believe is that every single word in there, you put in there just like you want it at the place you wanted it. The books, the way you wanted it, the way you lined it up different even than the Hebrew text and all that kind of stuff. You put it in there exactly how you wanted it. Amen. And I'm not to fool with it. I'm not to change it. I'm not to correct it. It's to change and correct me. And that way, that way the judge, the final judge is not a man in his education. Listen, b b being, being good in, in, in uh, linguistics and being good in languages, that don't have nothing to do with your heart. Suppose you, suppose you are a scholar in the Greek like uh, Robertson and some of them fellows are. And I got his stuff back there in my, uh, in my study. I read all, all, all his Greek stuff and all. I got the testaments, different Greek testaments and all that kind of stuff out there. So, suppose you do know. Suppose you, could speak, suppose you could speak ten different languages fluently. That's an intellectual thing. That's not a hard thing. That doesn't mean that you can understand God's word at all. God gives you the understanding. Amen. If he doesn't give you the understanding, then you're not going to go anywhere with it. I don't care what your intellect is. The final warning is don't fool with that book. All right? What's the final prophecy? What is the final prophecy that he mentions? Uh, verse number 20. He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. The last prophecy that you find in your Bible that the Lord um, reminds you of and tells you is the, is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And there are many prophecies in the Bible. I want you to understand there's a lot, of, a lot of prophecies in the Bible about many different things. But the last prophecy in the Bible is a reminder that Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's coming quickly. Notice three words you see there in this. You see the word surely. Number two, you see the word come. And number three, you see the word quickly. He says, surely, it is a fact he's going to return. 
not just some kind of spiritual thing. He is physically, literally going to return up in the air for us to call us out at the rapture. And then he's going to come back on a white horse and he is going to travel about a couple hundred miles and go through there and, and land on the Mount of Olives and split that thing and go through the eastern gate and over a Muslim graveyard and right into the city and just kill everything and everybody in sight and the blood's going to flow everywhere. Amen. Amen. Some of you like, like, uh, you like action movies. Well, they ought to make one about that. You like to see the blood flow and people get their heads cut off. All right, read that. Read that. That's the real thing, man. That ain't Hollywood. That's going to happen. And it's a reminder that he's coming quickly. <laughs> he's coming as a thief in the night. Now the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse number 8 that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. A thousand years is as one day with the Lord. Do you know what that means? He's only been gone about four days. You, you understand? I've only been gone about two days. I'm trying to figure this out. i got it all mixed up here. It's four in the Old Testament, two in the New Testament, 6,000, yeah. See, I'm, I'm from Alabama. We don't count good. <laughs> he hasn't, let's put it this way. He hasn't been gone very long. He's coming back. Amen. Do you believe he's coming back? Amen. Don't get backslid. <laughs> get ready. Don't mock the preacher that says, you know, I preacher, he's all the time talking about he's coming back, he's coming back. And I've heard preachers preach for years and years now, and they're all dead and gone, and he's coming back. Well, let me tell you one more time. <laughs> he's coming back. Amen. And he just hasn't got here yet, but listen, listen, he's coming back. He's coming back. And it doesn't matter what you and I think about it. It doesn't matter how we look at it. For such an hour as you think not. I wish everybody would shut up and quit predicting the, the return of Christ and the rapture. I want everybody to get to where they think, well, I don't, I don't know when he's coming. I ain't even going to think about it no more. Da -da -da -da. Then that's when he'll come. Everybody just, well, he's coming in 1980. Did you remember that book, you know, 88 reasons he's coming in 88. Then they wrote the book in 89, 89 reasons he's coming in. And then uh, he's got to come, you know, and everybody's just so sure when he's coming. Let me tell you what's probably going to happen to all of you if statistics prove it right. Every one of us in here is going to die before he comes back. I said, statistically, everyone in here is going to die before he comes back. We're not going to make it in the rapture. Now you say, Brother Dennis, you don't think the rapture is within 30 years? Yes, I do. I absolutely think it is. But, but I'm just telling you the way, the way it goes is that everybody before us has always died. All those, do you remember back in the 70s and the 80s when the sign of the times are everywhere? And, and uh, um, not Back to the Future, that was, a, that was a movie with Michael J. Foss. What's those, what those, uh, what's those rapture movies? What are they called? Uh, Left Behind, yeah. <laughs> Get my uh, things mixed up there. Left Behind. You remember when all those movies come out and everybody was like, he's coming back, he's coming back, you got to get ready, Christ is coming back. And that's 30 and 40 years ago. They're probably going to put us all to bed with a shovel. That's bad news, ain't it? We're all going to die. I had Dr. Ruppman sit across from me one time in breakfast, and I was asking him about the return of Christ, and he said, oh, yeah, brother, oh, yeah, can't be more than two years, can't be more than two years. That was probably like in 2013 or 14. I want him to come back. I wish he'd come back right now. Amen. I want him to come back. But you don't know when he's coming back. None of us do. But he's coming back. He is coming back. And he's coming at an hour that you don't think and... Don't worry about getting it dispensationally. Are you talking about the second advent? Are you talking about the day of Christ? Are you talking about the rapture? Oh, hush, man. Just in, try to, don't, don't try to be so doctrinal you can't even enjoy the message. <laughs> Just get happy he's coming back. He's coming back. Amen. And maybe I'm wrong. I hope we're going up in the air. I hope we're going up in there. Brother Tim Hoffman Bridal and Brother Dan's going, You were wrong, Brother Dennis. You were wrong. And I'm, I'm going to be like, I've... Yeah, amen. I'm glad I'm wrong. Let's just keep floating, man. I hope I am wrong. I hope he comes back soon. Amen. He can't come back soon enough. But he's coming back. He's coming back. 
Now, this is connected to that. I, we looked at the last warning in the Bible. This morning we looked at the last invitation in the Bible. Then we looked at the last warning. We looked at the last prophecy. What is the last prayer in the Bible? I mean, if God's going to end his book and show you a pretty, pretty good prayer, you and I ought to be praying. This is the prayer. He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Notice John's prayer. Even so come Lord Jesus. The last prayer in the Bible is amen. So be it. I agree. The last prayer in the Bible is not for world peace. It's not for all the starving children over in all the countries and for anybody to get saved. It's for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. We're not to go around singing, wait a little longer, please Jesus. A few more days to get our loved ones in. Listen. Listen. Listen, no matter when he comes back, there's going to be lost people that ain't going to be ready. And I don't want them to come back and find my, my family members and friends lost either, but that's a selfish thing. We ought to want the Lord Jesus to come back and get what's his. And rule and reign. <laughs> Mentioned in Dr. Ruttman again. How I many have you ever heard Dr. Ruttman when he was preaching there? He said, boy, if I had one prayer, if I just had one prayer and the Lord said, I'll answer that one prayer. He said, you ain't got to ask me what that prayer is, brother. I know what that prayer is. You just give me one prayer and God answer it. How many have you ever heard him say it? You know what I'm fixing to say? I'll tell you what he said. If I could just have one prayer answered, brother, just one prayer, I'll tell you what it'd be. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. I'd pray for the rapture. Amen, brother. Amen. If I could just have one prayer, one prayer, and God said I'd answer it. He said there ain't nothing that the return of Christ won't fix in your life. Do you believe that? Amen. That ought to be our prayer. Come on. Now, unfortunately, many Christians don't want them to come back. And I'm going to tell you just very briefly why you should want the Lord to come back. Number one, because the Bible says we should desire for Christ to come back. We ought to desire. We ought to desire for him to get what's rightfully his. You know what that Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, 7? That we are to be waiting for his coming. It says in Philippians 3.20, we are to be looking for his coming. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse number 12, we should be hastening in his coming. Come on. Come on. My daddy used to say something uh, years ago when I was a boy and he, I'd be lagging behind. He'd go, make, make haste, boy, make haste. You know what he means? Speed up. Come on, let's go. Do it. And that's what we ought to say about the Lord Jesus. Come on. Why should I want the Lord to come back? Why should you want the Lord to come back? Number two, because we will never sin again. We'll live in a sinless society. I will never hurt my Lord or anyone else again with sin. Will have a sinless body incapable of sinning. Now, does that sound pretty good to any of you? That sounds real good to me. I'm tired of me. You know, if you just get half as put out with yourself as you do somebody else, we'd be a lot better off. I'm tired of me. I'm the problem. It's not everybody else, it's me. And, and I can't wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back so I can get a body like his. Number three, we ought to want the Lord to come back because we will receive that perfect body. The Bible says, for this corruption must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be. Hallelujah. But we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. Yes, that's what the believer is going to get, a new body. We ought to want the Lord Jesus Christ to come back because a special reward is given to those who love his coming. That's what 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 8 teaches you. You get a crown of righteousness. That's one of the five crowns you can obtain. You get a crown of righteousness by loving and desiring and wanting him to come more than you stay down here and enjoy worldly pleasures. Let me tell you something. There ain't a place I want to go. There ain't a thing I want to see. There's nothing else I want to do, brother. There's nothing else I want to get involved in, nothing else I want to do, nothing else I want to see. I've had all I want of it. This is not where it's at. This is not the promised land. This is a land of misery. And one day I'm going to a place where there'll be no more sorrow and no more pain, and you will too. You ought to want the Lord to come back because we will be reunited with our saved loved ones. Our saved loved ones are coming back in the air with Jesus. We say we're going to meet them in heaven. Well, but doctrinally, that's not, even, that's not really correct. You're going to meet them in the air. 
You ain't even go, you're going to meet up with them for even get to heaven. We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. I got some folks over there I want to see. You, all, you have some folks over there you want to see. And we're going to see them. We ought to want the Lord Jesus Christ to come back because uh, we will be with our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That same passage there in the, talks about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 17 says, And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know what makes heaven heaven? The Savior is going to be there. That's what makes heaven heaven. The Savior is going to be there. We're going to be with him forever. And we ought to want the Lord to come back because we will finally make it home. We're strangers and we're pilgrims and we're vagabonds and we should not be putting our claim down down here. Folks, there's nothing wrong with having something down here. I hope you all do. Really, I do. I hope you all do. I don't, I don't want you to... I don't think it's a sign of spirituality to be broke. <laughs> but I don't think it's a sign of spirituality to be rich. Yeah. I think you ought to set your affections on things above, not on things below. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, then let the Lord take care of this kind of stuff. But the problem is we have laid up treasures in heaven. We have not, rather, laid up treasures in heaven where rust and moth doth not corrupt. We've laid it up down here. And it's not going with us. I've preached a bunch of funerals. Listen to me. I've preached a bunch of funerals. I've never seen one dead body take a U-Haul and hook up and take anything with them. I've seen crazy people do all kind of crazy things. Try to sneak whiskey in the casket and put a pack of cigarettes in there and put, put something in there so they'll have it on the other side. They're not going to have it on the other side. Naked you came in this world, and naked you're going to leave. Do you realize all that stuff that means something to you? All that stuff that I go over there on, uh, <clears throat> go down there on Folks Road where I live. We got a big old she shed full of Darby's junk and a little bitty one full of mine. <laughs> and I've collected stuff all the years. I got to thinking about this today. I went through my folder, and I've got stacks, hundreds, hundreds of sermons and notes and illustrations and teachings and all that. You know what God thinks about all that work and education and college and everything and writing and reading? You know what he thinks about all that? He's going to burn it all up. And I'm like, Lord, you're going to burn my sermons up? <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, Holmes. They were your sermons. <laughs> He's going to burn it up. Everything that you achieve... We got a pretty nice, snazzy building around here, ain't we? Beautiful, ain't it? Yeah. He's going to burn it up. He's going to burn it up. It's just going to be ashes floating all over Dyersburg. <gasps> Don't say it. Don't say he's going to burn Holy Hills up. Yeah, he is. He's going to burn the thing up. Burn the parking lot up. Burn the building up. Burn the basketball goal up back there. Burn the corn toss up. Burn the ping pong table up. Burn the chairs up. Burn this fancy piano up. I'm gonna burn this stage up. This big old pulpit that gonna burn it up. I'm gonna burn the whole thing up. It means nothing to him. Listen to me. Listen to me. When you die, you're leaving it all. You're leaving it all behind. And the only thing you're gonna have up there waiting on you is what you've sent ahead. And that's the problem. We have too many Christians that are rich down on the earth, but they're not rich toward God. And you can't be both. Now, I know here in America, the way we live is rich considered most of the world. But you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm telling you, the last prayer is for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. It's the only thing that's going to change this world. And then I want to look at the last reminder in the Bible, or the benediction. Verse number 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.
Do you realize this is the last book in the Bible, so this is the last benediction? This is the last closing of the book. And I want you to notice this. This is the very last book, not only in the last, I mean very last verse, rather, of not only the last book in the Bible, but it's the very last verse in the entire Bible. Now, don't you think God would think about how he wants to end the entire, if the very last thing he wants to say, and you know what it is? <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. I know in the context, talking to saved people, but God is a God of grace. Amen. And his very last verse, his very last verse has to do with the grace of God. Ain't that good? Amen. Where sin did abound, grace did what, church? Much more abound. It reminds us that the last invitation in the Bible is by grace. The last proper, uh, prophecy and prayer concerning our being ready for the Lord's return has to do with His grace. It takes grace to be saved and grace to live the Christian life and grace to get through life. And the last thing He wants you to remember maybe as you shut this book. Maybe some sinner looking for Christ. Maybe some new Christian, maybe some saint has been saved for many, many years. Maybe, maybe there's somebody sitting in here, you've been through the Bible many, many times. You've been saved a long time and you've read through the Bible many, many times. Has it ever occurred to you that every time you go through your Bible again, the very last verse you always read is, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, that's a good way to close it, ain't it? So you say, what's important? What is the Lord wanting to show us or trying to show us? Is he? Well, as I told you this morning, I get ready to close. All of the Bible is important, every bit of it. There's, there's not any part of the Bible that's not important. It's all equally inspired. But there are some verses, as I said, if you try to look at the lineage and the chrono chronology of the uh, stuff going on over there in First Chronicles and th things like that, and you try to compare that to a gospel given in the, in the book of John, that's, that's not a right comparison. There's some verses, salient verses, there's some verses that are more important and carry more weight than other. And I would just think what would carry a weight is, okay. This is the very last thing I want to tell you. And so what is that? What was that? If we get ready to close this second part of this message I began this morning. Well, how, how does he want to end it? Okay. He says, I want to tell you one more time that you ought to come to me. I want to tell you one more time not to fool with my word. I want to tell you one more time that you ought to want me to come back. You ought to pray for me to come back. You ought to desire for me to come back. And I want to tell you one more time that it's the grace of God that you even got this book, can read this book, can understand this book, and can avoid the plagues that that particular book told you about and void hell that he told you about it's the grace of God Amen. I don't I don't I don't think God was just going through there and said okay let's just we, we don't come this far now let's just figure out a way to wrap this up I don't believe that I don't believe that he ended it purposely and divinely just like he wanted to end it so I'm asking you to consider what he considers Worthy to remember at the end, at the end of the world, and at the end of your life. Amen, church? Amen. All right, let's bow our head and close our eyes.